In Lecture 11, we dealt with the creation of angels and men, and when one of the camera men showed me that I had only one minute left, I felt I just simply had to say something about how, in Edwards' opinion, a man created upright could sin. And so I hastily added that at the end. But now, in lecture number 12, on the fall and amputation, I'm going to go over this matter of greatest importance, sort of slow motion, as it were, so that we get the significance of his thinking on this crucial matter. We come now to man whose everlasting existence in heaven or hell has been eternally and irrevocably decreed by his eternal God, all of this to come about by his own inviolable will. We have seen in the chapter on man how he was originally made perfect and upright in knowledge, holiness, and truth. We now take up the saga with his probation in the garden and sin's first entrance into his world and then how this sin was transmitted to us all, whereupon the man Christ Jesus enters the world to save his own from hell and purchase eternal salvation for them, letting the rest of mankind refuse his divine overtures and bring eternal damnation upon themselves. This is one of the greatest problems for theism in general and Christianity in particular, how a good man could sin and fall. We're not surprised that Jonathan Edwards faced up to the problem. He writes, if it be inquired how man came to sin, seeing he had no sinful inclinations in him except God took away his grace from him that he had been wont to give him and so let him fall. I answer, there was no need of taking away anything that had been given him, but he sinned under that temptation because God did not give him more, because God did not give him more. He did not take away that grace from him while he was perfectly innocent, which grace was his original righteousness, but he only withheld his confirming grace. Given now in heaven, grace as shall surmount every temptation. Let me explain some of this language, which may not be so familiar to all of you, but original righteousness refers to the holiness and virtue which man had together with dominion over the creatures by very creation. He was made in God's image, and that was the origin from which all his righteous behavior actually did spring. We're later on going to discuss original sin, which is commonly thought to refer to the first sin, but that is not the meaning of the term when used with sin as an expression, original sin, but it means the opposite of original righteousness. Remember, God created man upright in his own image, and from that holy nature, his righteousness proceeded. As a result of the fall, we are all born with a body of corruption. And from that weedium originis, as it was called, or original seedbed of evil, all the sins of practice emanate. So though this is closely connected with the first sin, it doesn't refer to that. It means that when we were first created, we had a nature from which virtue sprung, and as a result of our fall in Adam, we have 
a nature from which vice or evil springs. This is the origin of sin, as that was the origin of righteous behavior. And what Edwards is saying here is that what caused the loss of this original righteousness was not a deficiency in man so much as a failure to call upon the confirming grace of God. Man had enough grace given to him in his original righteousness that he could have continued in holiness, but he needed more to keep him utterly from the possibility of falling. Edwards calls that, and so did Tariton and many other Reformed theologians, confirming grace. It wasn't strictly necessary, but on the other hand, if man was going to persevere without the possibility of falling, he should have called upon it, and Augustine had the same thinking, that if he had called upon it, he would never have failed. So in a certain sense, though they don't usually put it this way, what orthodoxy says is the cause of the fall is a sin of omission more than a sin of commission in the first place. Or it's a sin of the omission of calling for the even greater strength of God which was available, which would have made a possible fall impossible, and so on. And then not doing that, then they exploited the possibility of sinning. You know the immortal language, of course, of Augustine, pasa pacara, or pasa non pacara in their original state. They were able to do this, to live upright and never fall, and they would most certainly have done it had they called upon the assistance of God, according to Augustine, had they called upon the confirming grace of God. But even though their nature was original righteousness, because they were creatures and not in and of themselves unchangeable, they were capable of falling away from virtue, falling into sin. They were pasa pacara, and that's the possibility, alas, which Adam exploited as we all are painfully aware. He writes, Edwards does, in a later miscellany, that the free will of man has not so much freedom now as he had before the fall in this respect. Now he has a will against a will. I remind you about wicked man's inconsistency with himself and so on. Now fallen man has a will against a will, an inclination contrary to his reason. Judgment which begets contrary inclination, and this latter inclination is often overcome and suppressed by the former. But before the fall, the inclination that arose from reason and judgment never was held down by the inferior inclination, so that in that sense, he was more free, or as they speak, had more freedom of will. I read that because there are people who maintain, very fine students of Jonathan Edwards, who maintain he really did differ from the Westminster Confession of Faith on this matter. He didn't really believe an unfallen man had a free will. Now, Edwards is saying there was a sense in which the will of Adam as created was freer than the will of Adam and his descendants as fallen. But the way he puts it is, before the fall, the inclination that arose from reason and judgment never was held down by the inferior inclination so that in that sense, he was more free, or as they speak, had more freedom of will. I'll say as an aside that I think this is a pretty desperate gesture on Edward's part, and I don't really feel that it changes the basic verdict uh, 
about him in this matter, but it does show he's alert to it, trying to respond to it, and apparently is satisfied, as I am not, with his explanation. But it is still in an unpublished sermon in Romans 5 that Edwards goes somewhat further. In this unpublished sermon, Edwards virtually admits Man, as he dwells in flesh, dwells in a house of clay and has his foundation in the dust. Hence the devil, the enemy of mankind, was a much stronger and subtler being than man was in his primitive state, as it proved. The sermon continues, man has lost his primitive strength by the fall. He was altogether a dependent being then and was a feeble creature in comparison of some other creatures and the strength he had was a communicated, derived strength. But he has lost that strength. Now, he has destroyed and undone himself. He has deprived and confounded his whole nature. He is now a poor, weak, sickly creature, and not only so, but a dead creature. Man in his first estate might have asserted his own liberty, but now he is brought into slavery insists Edwards. Throughout this sermon, Edwards reminds his hearers that they are all so weak. The sermon was for this man who had cut his throat during the first uh, awakening and terminated the awakening by that in Northampton. But this man had a melancholic disposition, and Edwards in his sermon shows a kind of tender awareness of that, but projects it more generally, as you've heard me read a moment ago. But he reminds his hearers that they are all weak. This man may have been a case in neurotics, but all of us are weak, says he. And if God did not restrain them, the devils could easily persuade any one of them to commit, quote, adultery or sodomy or bigamy, murder or blasphemy, as others have done, or that we haven't destroyed our own life, as Uncle Hawley had done, and it's because God's mercy towards us don't cease that we being already tore to pieces by Satan, and we shall be destroyed by him before tomorrow morning if God don't keep us. Worse than suicide, you will be liable to favor heretical opinions turn deist as others. You get that? Heresy is a far worse sin than bigamy and adultery and sodomy and all kinds of perversion. Far worse than becoming a convert, a pervert, would be to become a deist, an anti-supernaturalist a Bible-hating, opposing individual. You could consider yourself fortunate as you suffer only from psychological disorders, Edwards is saying, and all of us do. He doesn't say have a melancholic disposition, but we are liable to some things far worse than this suicide had committed. The only real difference here seems to be that unfallen man had available this confirming grace that fallen man does not have. God creates man, and man creates sin. But original man could have avoided it if he had called on the available grace. But he really could not have done so without more created character, according to Edwards. Edwards does attempt to trace sin to self-love. That was and is natural to man. But even as created, man had to have his self 
controlled by the Creator. Man's self-interest alone, while he did not appeal to God's control, wrought havoc. You get the idea here. Self-love is not a sin, but nevertheless uncontrolled by the superior excellence of God's love, or love for God, and so on. Self-love, not a vice in itself, can nevertheless wreak havoc. This was Augustine's causa deficiens, deficient cause, versus causa efficiens, or efficient cause. And the same problem for both great Christian theologians. In my opinion, as theoretical theologians, certainly Augustine and Jonathan Edwards are the greatest we have ever had since the canon of Scripture and the writings of the Apostle Paul ceased. Edwards makes the comment on Romans 7, 14, but one can see that it could easily apply to Genesis chapter 3. He admits that self-love, duly regulated, is of great use in religion. We have a bit of a raging debate among us at the present time, you know, whether self-love is a vice or a virtue. Edwards believes it's a virtue, easily turned aside into a vice. He admits that self-love, duly regulated, is of great use in religion, but we've noticed that without the love of God, it cannot be duly regulated. In unconverted persons, self-love, which was made to be a servant, has become master, Edwards preached. But we have noted that in man as created and unfallen also, it had become the master. When Edwards says that man in his first estate may have asserted freedom, but now is in bondage, he's simply contradicting himself implicitly when he preaches that man is naturally proud. He has a bit of a problem there, you see. God created man naturally upright. How can naturally man as created, natural man as created, in the image of God, be naturally proud. I think that was a little slip on Edwards, but Homer nodded at that point. I think he meant what? It's very easy for a person with this divine gift of self-love, which duly regulated, is of great benefit in true religion not to be duly regulated, and it's almost native to man to exalt himself because of such a gift rather than keeping it in subordination to the service of God. Only with Christ, the God-man, does uh, Jonathan Edwards have a creature incapable of sinning. Adam, the first surety of mankind, failed in his work because he was a mere creature and so a changeable one. Though he had so great a trust committed to him as the care of the eternal welfare of all his posterity, yet not being unchangeable, he failed and transgressed God's holy covenant. He was led aside and drawn away by the subtle temptation of the devil. He being a changeable being, his subtle adversary found means to turn him aside. And so he fell, and all his posterity fell with him. I may say that is a standard explanation. In my mind, it's the only conceivable explanation for the fall of man. And yet it doesn't really explain it. It only explains, it seems to me, the possibility of it. I don't think anyone is going to dispute the fact that a creature, by definition, is a changeable being. The creator is immutable, unchangeable. There's nothing to change him. On the other hand, we creatures are dependent on everything, and we are constantly changing, 
And that does at least open the possibility of changing from what we were to what we become, and even in the realm of morals, from a virtuous person to a disobedient and sinful person. What it doesn't explain, and Edwards doesn't seem to be sensitive to this, nor do most of the theologians that I've ever read seem to be sensible to this. Granted that the creature is changeable. What reason was there for him to change? He knew that his life came from God. He knew his life depended on God. He knew that obedience spelled eternal life for him and all of his progeny. He could change, yes, but why would he change? Why would he listen to a devil? Why, he, why would he adhere to a creature, knowing as he did the knowledge of God? This explains the Pasapakara. How could he do it? But what I'm asking is why would he do it? Granted, he could, but it remains an unsolved mystery, in my opinion, why man ever did change as he did change for the unspeakably worse. A brief comment on the imputation or reckoning of sin or how Adam's first sin became that of all of his descendants. Here he is drastically, Edwards, from different from John Calvin and most Calvinists, though he ends with a variety of immediate imputation or reckoning of sin, more Calvinist than Cal more Calvinistic than Calvin. That is, Calvin. Uh, the standard Calvinistic doctrine is that the guilt of Adam was immediately imposed on those whom he represented. The immediate view, which John Calvin, along with a minority of Calvinists, maintained was that man, from his descendancy through Adam, became a sinner, and because he was a sinner, through the mediation of his sinfulness, he was judged guilty, or guilt was imputed or reckoned to him. But going even beyond that, to immediate, immediate imputation. Here's where Edwards is unique, and everybody knows it, and the uh, volume in the Yale University Press, edited by Clyde Holbrook, has a very thorough discussion of this subject in the uh, introduction. But let me summarize this uh, here, the immediate imputation view, the immediate recom imputing a reckoning of the sin of Adam to the sinner came through the fact that by the inheritance of Adam, he became a sinner. And because we're all born sinners, we, through the mediation of the guilt we have, the, uh, I mean the sinfulness we have, the imputation of Adam's guilt is given to us. That was Calvin's view, but it's a minority view among Calvinists. The immediate view is the normal one that first Adam's sin is reckoned to us, and because we are born guilty, we are then made sinners, and so on. But the guilt is immediate, not immediate. Now, when I say Jonathan Edwards is immediate, immediate, and in that sense, he is a minority indeed, almost one, very few people have been with him on this, but what he is saying, maybe I can read a few statements of his before I elucidate it a little bit more, but he is in this tradition going even a little more thoroughly in that direction. He's with the majority, and he's in a sense at the pinnacle of that type of uh, thought to which his colleagues uh, never uh, ascended. A brief comment on the imputation of sin uh, uh, to his descendants according to uh, Edwards. It's been much debate about this matter, and much of it concerns Edwards' view. I can only summarize here the traditional view I've just given you, and, I'll, and uh, then the view of, uh, of others, and now I want to try to explain Edwards. One, it's universally granted that a person cannot be blamed for something he did not himself choose and do. 
Some people, when you're talking about original sin and so on, can't quite understand that, but let me read it once again. And it's universally granted that a person cannot be blamed for something he did not himself choose and do. That is to say, I, John Gerstner, cannot be blamed for something that the first created man named Adam. Adam is just, just means earth, you know, and just another word for man, for the first man. I cannot be blamed for anything my wife does, or my son does, or you do. Not to mention somebody I don't know from Adam and so on. I'm saying that is an originally accepted viewpoint, universally granted that a person cannot be blamed for something that he himself did not choose to do. Two, immediate imputationists maintain. People who hold a general reform view on this matter maintain that all men are responsible for Adam's sin because fairly imputed to them by a God who appointed Adam to act in their behalf. No, I was not in the garden, or you, you didn't eat that forbidden fruit, nor I, but the person God appointed to act on our behalf did. And in that sense of the word, I ate that forbidden fruit which God had warned me would bring eternal death. Immediate imputationists insist that the descendants did not themselves so choose and act, and so they shouldn't really be liable. That's our reason for rejecting that view, even though it was held by Calvin. Four, immediate imputationists respond that God's appointing Adam to choose and act for the descendants is the same thing as their so doing, and even fairer, because making the descendants' destiny ride on Adam's choice adds an even greater incentive to persevere in holiness than each individual choosing for himself alone could have had. Five, immediate imputationists insist that an individual cannot be blamed or praised for something he did not himself, God's appointment notwithstanding, choose to do. Now, Edwards, whether he accepted that as a valid objection to the traditional form of orthodoxy or not, argued that God identified Adam with his posterity so that his choice and act was their choice and act. That is federal representationism with a vengeance. Traditional orthodoxy, old Princeton, for example, saw Edwards as an orthodox imputationist in spite of his identity doctrine. However, general confusion resulted as Edwards' method of defending orthodoxy became identified with Calvinistic orthodoxy in the so-called consistent Calvinists, the designation for them in New England, Hopkins and others, to whom the Princetonians were opposed for other reasons, and thus they threw out the Edwardsian bath with the Hopkinsian wash. That's just a little bit of historical uh, uh, sequence to this thing. But you see what Edwards is actually saying. It wasn't that Adam was appointed to act for you. You were actually identified with Adam. Remember when we talked about continuous creation and the way in which you would continue as a being even though you were constantly being recreated by God's constituting you an identity. So this pattern of thought is easily seen to be applicable to the Adamic fall. Adam doesn't merely represent you, just as you were identified with you. By a divine constitution, you can be identified with another person. And God does identify you with Adam. Whatever you may think of the theory, it is one magnificent answer 
to the person who says, I can't be held responsible for something I did not do, even though somebody I chose or somebody with authority chose for me represented me. He is utterly silenced if it can be proven that he did do the choosing. He and Adam were one. Adam didn't merely represent him. He ate that fruit. He committed that sin. So let him never say again. He can't justly be held responsible for the sin which he himself actually committed. Thus saith Jonathan Edwards. <laughs>